The Love Quest, or Sweetheart Search, was the longest real-life saga of Christian Weston Chandler. His goal was to obtain a girlfriend. The stated purpose of the love quest was to meet the woman who would be his true love and solve all of his problems and bear his daughter, Crystal. Said quest represented the focus effort to do everything in his power to achieve romantic fulfillment, except of course, improving himself. Now, before the video begins, I've been informed that to prevent the dimensional merge from occurring, you must subscribe. Because with the current 5% subscribers, we're not strong enough to stop the dimensional merge from happening. And with that message out of the way, let the video begin. While Chris maintained a belief in waiting for marriage to have sex due to his religious principles, Chris started moving away from the idea of being faithful as he interacted with a number of fake sweethearts, down to wanting sex from Jackie first and foremost when he first started communicating with her, and later being open to being in an open relationship where he could sleep with other people rather than a monogamous one. Because of this, Chris's antics are derisively referred to as the f*** quest. For over a decade, from 2003 to 2018, the love quest was ongoing with Chris, unsurprisingly, not having made any progress whatsoever in finding a romantic partner. In April 2012, he lost his virginity to a prostitute, which was mainly motivated by a fear of going to jail for the Michael Snyder incident. He ultimately got a slap on the wrist instead of having to serve hard time in prison. During early 2018, Chris was brainwashed by the idea guys into ending his love quest. He was told that he was happily married to several of his fictional OCs. Unfortunately, that was not the end of his story, as Chris went from believing in the marriage to eventually having sex with very questionable consent with his own mother, which did result in Chris serving hard time. The catalyst for the love quest was Christian's encounter with Sarah Hammer, on whom he had a crush during his move back to Rockersville and his enrollment at the Piedmont Virginity Community College. This occurred somewhere between June 2000 and October 2003. Sarah is presumably the first woman of any significance to tell the ever naive Christian, I have a boyfriend. Chris was surprised to learn that his childhood gal pal was romantically involved with the one and only Wes Eisley. Upon making this discovery, he quickly developed an intense jealousy of Eisley, who he didn't even know at the time, and resentment towards him that would set his state of mind for the impending quest. Throughout 2003, Chris passively expressed his longing and envy by way of Chris plus Sarah's life shares and BFF's best friends forever. It is clear that Chris at some point decided Sarah was supposed to be his soulmate, although perhaps not until he learned she was unavailable, and had difficulty accepting that this would not be a possibility. In 2005, following Sarah's breakup with Isley and hookup with William Spicer, he dealt with this situation more openly and publicly in Sonic 2 issue 2, this acceptance perhaps stemmed from his turn to a new object of infatuation. According to Chris, the genesis of the love quest was his 21st birthday, the 24th of February 2003. On this date, he was kicked out of his college English class after a dispute with his teacher. In his Wikipedia biography, Chris claimed the teacher ejected him simply on account of his autism, which of course bears no resemblance to reality. When asked about it again later by a girlfriend, he forgets to mention that it may have had to do with him belligerent slandering classmates and making several racist remarks. At any rate, while waiting for his next class, Chris sat and cried his eyes out, resenting that there was nobody to comfort him like there was at his graduation. Shortly thereafter, he resolved that he needed a girlfriend. Presumably, the connection between these events is that Chris felt hurt and ostracized by his punishment, leading him to recognize his need for someone who would appreciate him unconditionally. However, Chris further states that the love quest officially began in August 2003, suggesting that he waited six months to actually execute his plans. At some point early on in the quest, Chris developed an intense socially crippling fear that all women, at least all the women he likes, have boyfriends, also known as the infinitely high boyfriend factor. The infinitely high boyfriend factor is Chris's primary concern on his love quest. It refers to the incredibly high probability that any given girl he speaks to will already have a boyfriend, making it impossible for him to find a sweetheart. The fear of the factor leaves Chris all but paralyzed when he even thinks about speaking to a woman in real life, a fear he has named noviophobia. Mathematicians have worked in vain for years to disprove Chris's theorem, but the proof is in the pudding. 
Chris is still single, so it must be because all the jerks have taken all the pretty girls. The realization led him to narrow his search and focus on boyfriend free girls. <laughs> If one uses the recently passed number of 8 billion people and assuming that half of them are men, applying the infinitely high boyfriend factor, that means that there are 4 billion times 0.0000000000004, which equals 0.016 males in the world that Chris doesn't hate. Since his autism causes him to approach social tasks in the bluntest manner possible, it can be inferred that his initial approach was to walk up to a woman out of nowhere and frankly ask if they would go out with him. It may be further inferred that Chris's unrelenting persistence made it extremely difficult for a woman he liked to get rid of him, short of claiming that they had a boyfriend. In any case, Chris quickly lost nearly all of his confidence in talking to a woman and developed an irrational hatred of boyfriends or jerks, i.e all men everywhere except himself and his father. Since this time he has always specified that his potential girlfriend must be a boyfriend-free girl, which is unnecessary outside of some kind of polygamous arrangement. By October 2003, Chris had put into practice what was the only sensible idea he could come up with that was inexpensive, sitting on the PVCC campus holding a sign that read, I am a 21-year-old male seeking an 18-21-year-old to 21 -year -old single female companion. This would be the first of many versions of the the infamous attraction sign, a vital tool in the love quest for several years to come. Sometime during October, the school's Dean of Student Services, Mary Lee Walsh, confronted Chris and confiscated his sign. According to Chris's recollection of the event, it went like this. Then, in mid-October, the quote-unquote Dean of Student Services, Mary Lee Walsh, approached me and pulled my sign away from me and told me, you're not allowed to find true love here. My heart was shattered that very moment. What is far more likely to have occurred is this. Walsh probably decided Chris was making a nuance of himself and asked him what he thought he was doing. Chris probably delivered a big confusing monologue about seeking true love and Walsh then likely dismissed the substance of Chris's response with, you can't do that here. Walsh's point of contention was undoubtedly just the sign, whatever Chris may have to say about it. Undaunted by Walsh, Chris simply made a new sign, but a few weeks later, Walsh confronted him again. In late January 2004, Chris revised his strategy, leaving copies of the Sonic Choose News Dash newsletter strewn about campus, each one containing a single personalized ad about himself. By February, Walsh had cracked down on Chris again, banning the distribution of the news dash. Owning to repeated violations of campus policy, Walsh took Chris to her office to discuss the problem with him. In Chris's own words, Then that B-Doc ripped up my notes and all, dragged me to her quarters and talked down to me very rudely and hoarsely. I reacted with my own attack that she had been asking for the whole time. I was kicked out of PVCC for a whole year and I had to take an anger management course and see a psychiatrist for a while. The extent of the quote-unquote attack Chris made against Walsh, whether it was physical or just a cursier hameha, is unknown, although it would have had to been something pretty serious to get him suspended from PVCC and forced to undergo counselling. The timing of the incident is also unclear, but Chris has cited the 16th of September 2004 as the date of his suspension. By August 2004, Chris had expanded his quest to other attraction locations beside PVCC, such as Charlottesville Fashion Square. It was here that he attempted a new new tactic, which she was inspired by the anime Excel Saga, which was laying a red string of fate across the mall floor. No, I'm not making this up, Chris genuinely thought that something he saw in an anime would work in real life. This inevitably led to a confrontation with mall security, making this Chris's first recorded encounter with the mythical jerk -ops. By September, Chris had somehow learned that loitering in public places with a sign advertising his services as a boyfriend made it look like he was trying to sell 
himself like a new car, but he still managed to miss the point and believe this was something he could work to his advantage. He continued to have confrontations with mall security until the 11th of September 2004 when he was arrested, handcuffed and forbidden from entering the mall without one of his parents. With both of his attraction locations denied to him, Chris became more lonely and depressed than usual. In his diary, he expressed an interest in asking Santa Claus for a girlfriend. According to emails leaked by Jackie, Chris was completely serious and believed in Santa until he was a ripe old age of 24. At some point in 2004, Chris had expanded his activities in the mall, including pacing around a lot, playing video games on his Game Boy Advance SP, shouting at walls, or singing random songs from memory now and then. He was apparently infamous to Anna McLaren and her friends by the time he finally worked up the nerve to enter the store where Anna worked to strike a conversation with her. Anna handled herself as politely as she could while having zero interest whatsoever in his pathetic romantic overtures, and apparently convinced him that she was off the market. Despite becoming one of Chris's closest friends, Anna would later document the 2004 incident in a 2006 blog post, confirming that, despite whatever good qualities she sees in Chris, deep down she knows he's a few electric hedgehog Pokemon short of a chaotic combo. On March 29th, 2005, Chris, who had somehow regained full access to the mall, momentarily believed his prayers had been answered when he was approached by Hannah, a girl who worked at the local Starbucks. She invited Chris to have a coffee with her. Chris quickly overreacted to his sudden reversal of fortune, calling his mother and showing Hannah his entire Sonic 2 scrapbook. Anna McLaren later informed Chris that Hannah was simply trolling him for the lulls. In shock, Chris confronted Hannah and, when she admitted the truth, he ran away screaming no. He apparently made enough of a scene to get himself banned from the mall once again. Subsequently, Chris dramatized the whole story in his Sonic 2 comics where he was able to get the last word in exactly the way he could not in real life. Around June 2005, with the mall becoming a more difficult place to pick up chicks, Chris turned to his local Walmart where he would go to the in-store McDonald's, set up his sign and various nerd amusements and wait around for a few hours. On the 20th of June 2005, Chris was confronted by the man he identified as B Manager and married senior comic, who took issue with his sign and, probably in reaction to his belligerent behavior, called the police on him. Chris hid the sign, effectively avoiding criminal charges for sexual solicitation, but he was banned from the McDonald's. He did not interpret this to mean he was banned from the Walmart, however. And on the 22nd of June, after the first incident, Chris again came into conflict with the B Manager over his pixel block sculptures, and the conflict drew the attention of W.M. Manajerk. The Manajerk apparently attempted to discuss the situation with Chris, but I sat silent for a minute. Then I said to him, I do not speak to any other man than myself because they all have taken all the pretty girls, leaving me with none. Verbal combat had started, and during the fight I ran off, still giving verbal punishment, as well as the finger, and many cursed Yehami has. I nearly backed up onto him with my car and gave him another finger, then I dashed off. In July, unsurprisingly, having been banned from Walmart, Chris relocated to the newly opened Charlottesville Target, where he quickly found himself in trouble for loitering. Chris refused to leave at first, but when store employees returned with police officers, including the one-man army himself, Baggett, Chris offered to leave if they would listen to a prepared speech. According to Chris's account of the incident, five officers then jumped on him and hogtied him without provocation. His account is so blatantly fantastic and biased that it's difficult difficult to draw any conclusions about what actually happened. For five police officers to have subdued him, he must presumably have been egregiously stubborn in dealing with them. Indeed, in the dramatization of these events in Sonic 2 issue 4, the Jerkops need nothing short of a giant robot to capture Chris, and this time his twin sister rescues him so that they can destroy the Jerkops entire operation, which of course is commanded remotely by the one and only Mary Lee Walsh from the PVCC, also known as the private villa of corrupted citizens. Chris has said that he was eventually cleared of all criminal charges related to the dispute at Target. It was apparently at this point that his mother, in a dazzling display of parental guidance, informed him about two years too late that the attraction sign made him look a bit retarded. Chris met Megan Schroeder in the summer of 2005 and was immediately attracted by such qualities as her gender, her lack of a boyfriend, 
and a willingness to actually talk to him. In Chris's mind, these key factors meant that Megan was already destined to be a sweetheart, and the only thing left to do was convince Megan to accept his truth. The love quest was effectively on hold from this time until March 2008. One of Chris's writings during this time demonstrate that he believed he was already in a monogamous relationship with Megan and further sweetheart search was unnecessary. Aside from Megan's complete disinterest in romance with Chris, the relationship suffered other stumbling blocks, such as Megan's discomfort at Chris showering her with gifts, Megan's outrage over Chris's sexual harassment, hatred of men and rampant homophobia, and most damningly, Megan's discovery that Chris had to draw himself finger-banging her to surpass his fantasies of assault and raping her. Even though she reacted as a normal human being would in the same situation, he was still shocked that she broke up with him and thought that all he had to do was say I'm sorry as much as possible. Chris's obsession with Encyclopedia Dramatica was what led to the end of the friendship, since his attempt to blow Encyclopedia Dramatica's mind by posting his own Rule 34 drawings caused her to discover what a deranged individual he truly was and break off all contact with him. Chris totally missed the point about the finger-banging picture, believing that its continued presence on Encyclopedia Dramatica was the issue, and ludicrously that Megan didn't understand what was going on in it. This contributed to his drive to shut the site down for much of 2008 until people on the internet figured out the simplest way to troll him. After becoming an infamous lolcow thanks to his edit war with Encyclopedia Dramatica, Chris began to receive unexpected attention from attractive single women who loved his comics and totally weren't just looking to troll him. Since then, Chris has taken his love quest onto the internet, proclaiming his true and honest sweetheart is whichever girl he's managed to pin down. Chris, or someone impersonating Chris, has at one point attempted appealing to Yahoo Answers on how a lonesome fella can attract a boyfriend-free girl, going as far as mentioning his previous tactics and even asking his answerers to be his sweetheart. With each sweetheart he meets online, Chris follows a predictable pattern, demonstrating what he had always intended to do with any woman he met in real life. He begins with a series of proclamations of his true and honest love, and then begins planning out how the woman will travel to his home. Chris professes to believe in the rule that sex is out of the question until the third date, but since he expects every romantic encounter to end in total success, he makes it clear, in as gentlemanly a fashion as he could manage, that he expects at the woman's earliest convenience. Amazingly, as each successive internet gal pal proves to be a troll, Chris becomes more devoted to the next one, to the point that within a month of meeting Ivy online, he began planning his marriage to a woman he had never even seen face to face. When addressing the question of why Chris readily takes each new troll at face value, his own mindset must be taken into consideration. Chris's prospects of finding a girl locally are virtually zero, and he knows this, although he thinks it's because they all already have boys friends. At the same time, the internet seems, from his point of view, to be an endless cavalcade of single attractive women who are fascinated with him, making an irresistible resource in his love quest. By now, Chris is fully aware that each woman he meets online could be a troll, <laughs> but each time he readily accepts evidence that she's not, and dismisses out of hand any suggestion that she is. He does this because he wants to believe she's real, the alternative is to surrender to absolute despair. Notably, in July 2009, a group of trolls managed to set up a genuine date with Chris and an overweight woman named Farin. Chris supposedly touched her a few times, but the date ended with Farin dumping him for obvious reasons. In Chris's final chat with Sarah May from early March 2009, he claimed that he planned to give up looking for a sweetheart online and return to searching for a girl in local Charlottesville. Trolls everywhere rejoiced for this could only mean one thing, a return to the fabled attraction sign, and the days of his exploits against the jerkops and his other IRL adventures. This effort only lasted so long, however. Chris's first attempt at a real-life date with Emily ended in tragedy for him, after the intervention of the one and only man in the pickle suit. Black and I, well, she broke up with me, cause the pickle man tricked me again. During the brief rolling and trolling era, in the early summer of 2009, Chris was allegedly spotted prowling Charlottesville Fashion Square in his Guitar Hero Metallica tattoo sleeves, but it wasn't long before he gave up or was simply banned from the Charlottesville Fashion Square and retreated back to the internet. In late October 2009, after a long hiatus, the sweetheart cycle began again, with the advent of the incredibly disturbing I Love You Casey. 
Chris initially found success in his campaign to pry Casey away from her current boyfriend, Liquid Chris, even managing to meet her in person on multiple occasions. Later, though, their relationship collapsed under the weight of Chris's bizarre and disturbing behavior. The opening months of 2010, when Chris landed himself in a romantic misadventure both in reality and online, he managed to pry himself out of his room for a while and in the process meet a real person, the Wallflower. Like Megan, however, she rebuffed all of his attempts at a more than friendly relationship and eventually cut off all contact with him. Meanwhile, one of his online personal ads led to an extended conversation with another potential sweetheart, but Chris tripped over his duck long before he ever got a chance to meet Jackie in real life. Despite this, Chris believed he had found another way to attract females, this time via the Flipnote Hatina, which is, despite being accessed on a DSi, still on the internet. Between the 17th of June and the 2nd of June 2010, Chris ignored Flipnote Hatina's family friendly policies and attempted to use it like a dating site. A lot of Chris's tags towards the female members were flirtatious to a point and he even made a flipnote calling out to every woman he had tagged or tagged him. However, despite the trolls swarming to attack, non-troll responses were made by girls he tagged, most of whom were in their tweens to early teens. Chris made numerous OkCupid profiles and has successfully attracted a sweetheart through it, Catherine. Once her gig was up, Chris began to plumb the depths of derangement with videos advertising himself to women of any orientation since, as a trans woman, Chris believes he now physically appeals to straight, bisexual and lesbian women all at once. In Sonic 2 issue 10, Chris revealed images of his imaginary future wife, Lovely Weather, and in September 2017, he remarked that he had fulfilled his comics prediction, following his entering into a relationship with his newest sweetheart, Jessica Quinn. However, this was not meant to be as she broke up with him in early October 2017. He posted on Facebook a few weeks later, saying that he did not need a significant other to define himself, hinting he may have given up on his love quest, but only time will tell. In January 2018, prompted by the Quick Sonichu prequel fan comic, Chris gave his thoughts on the love quest. I really worked too hard in something I should not have pushed too much on. The love quest? I really should have focused more on Sonichu, his life and all of that. Instead, I did too much with myself. I was more selfish back then. I really regret that I was. It has done a lot of damage to everyone around me. During the Idea Guy saga, Chris's belief in multiple dimensions was exploited and his sense of reality hijacked to make changes to many of Chris's characters, concepts and perspectives of the real world, with him considering them to be valid. Ideas involving the love quest include Chris being brainwashed into thinking of himself as a bisexual and Chris believing he's in a polyamorous marriage with his imaginary friends. Beginning in March 2018, Chris is already weak grasp on reality, having been eroded further under the Idea Guy's influence, he believed himself to be in a legitimate polyamorous marriage with Mewtwo and three of his own fictional characters. In April, Chris recorded Dick Lick with that is I, a video of him giving his imaginary husband, Magic Chan, a blowjob. Two weeks later, Chris flirted with Brian Frogboy over the internet. He also began to kiss men on the cheek in public, including a fan named Copitz in May and several attendees at the Too Many Games convention in June, leading him to be kicked out. Chris's belief in the polyamorous marriage, which was so strong that he told Whiskers, a female fan cosplaying as him, that he wasn't interested in dating her. And in July 2018, he also rebuffed a professed potential sweetheart, Miss Cherry. Showing no further interest in finding real-world China for himself, the love quest has come, if not to an underwhelmingly yet bizarre conclusion, at least to a long interlude not quite like anything before Chris Tree. It seems that, in a sense, the real love quest was the friends that Chris made along the way, quite literally. That being said, even in this state, Chris occasionally indicated his disappointment in not finding a romantic partner that actually exists. In one such post, he once again blames the trolls for his inability to find a woman instead of making an effort to reach out to someone offline line that doesn't involve waving a sign around or loitering on private property. With that post, Chris projected that he had a good Valentine's Day and that all the trolls were miserable when in actuality he spent it holed up in his house with his mother and pets, probably still depressed about his lot in life. Additionally, while speaking with Kawhi Sandbag, Chris indicated that he was still lonely and had considered one of the members of the Praetors for potential
potential relationship, but put it off under the belief that Magi-chan would soon cross into 1218. It remains to be seen whether Chris considers revamping his love quest again, or if he will continue to hold out for Magi-chan. The true end of this saga was made clear near the end of June, the boyfriend-free girl he had searched for all these years had been hiding under his nose and a pile of garbage this whole time. Unfortunately, this end is not what we all pictured, and the falling actions of this story likely involve him relieving the hour of Julie reveals herself day after day in prison because we, the people of 1218, would never let them be together. Hard Love Quest is a poem by Christian Weston Chandler. It was written on the 18th of January 2004 and published the next month in the second issue of Sonic 2 News Dash. In addition to being incredibly self-pitying to the point where it would make an emo kid vomit, the poem also had bad spelling and grammar, improper punctuation and capitalization, and no sense of rhythm or meter. A terrible poem in every conceivable regard. Note: The poem's title is presumably supposed to mean a love quest which is difficult not a quest for some hard love. Here you see a sad, lonesome Christian C. Without girlfriend love, he feels an older age, as he is still stuck as a virgin with rage. He searched low and high to the end. The only delay is the fear of being already beaten by a boyfriend. Why do all the girls have to be already taken? A real shame. Boyfriends of all girls of possible matches for me are really lame. As I sit and sigh, I watch the girls go by. Afraid of a lame interception, I sit out in the open with hesitation. Matching girls' descriptions are free. I wish one girl would notice and approach me. I would be way past cool, per se, if I could get a girlfriend by Valentine's Day. But for now, as you see, I I'm a sad, lonesome sea. Prior to cutting out the middle man and hiring a prostitute and later fucking his own mom, Chris had a set of beliefs regarding how a relationship should proceed and when it was acceptable for a couple to start getting intimate. As such, he alluded to the idea that Hanky Panky must occur on or after the third date. Chris, like many autistics, tends to view the world in absolute values and quantify things which, by the rest of the world's standards, can't be measured with numbers or any other exact reckoning, due to his difficulty in handling abstract ideas. His heart level and his scale of respect are key examples. In the same way, despite the fact that his entire life he has only been on three dates and all of them were troll setups, he has mapped out his dating plans precisely. The first two dates are spent getting to know each other and the third date ends with sex. Always. Chris has often shown that his ideas about sex are just as skewed as his thinking about any other aspect of relationships. In this case, he seems to believe that sex is almost like a fee paid after the couple has been together three times. It's hardly unusual, as Chris has often seemed to act as if he views sex as payment, during his friendship with Megan, for instance, as opposed to a mutual expression between partners. It was not out of character that when he did finally lose his virginity, it was to a prostitute. As with many times he's brought up sex, his fantasies sound a lot more like coercion or rape than what goes on between a loving couple. The third date rule, or three date rule, is a notion common in popular writing about sex and relationships. Variations include the fifth date rule, the second date rule and others, but it's most often remarked that one should wait until the third date, at least before having sex, so as not to have an awkward relationship predicted on sex instead of true and honest feelings. Although, one notable variation states that the relationship is not worth pursuing if both parties are not interested in sex by the third date. While it referred to as a rule, no sane person would actually take this saying so seriously. It's a guideline at best. Chris being a long way from sane seems to have twisted the idea into a rigid, unbreakable law. If he can make it through three dates with one woman, he will get laid. Despite his frequent insistence that the third date mandate sex, Chris has proven himself unwilling to wait even that long. He's quick to remind the girl that they can always go further if she wants to, though the insistence is evident. Even when he isn't specified about what time the sex will occur, he'll always bring that up that he's looking forward to it, and thus making sure she's well aware that he has expectations which must be met. In his meticulous description of plans for meeting Blanca Weiss, Chris proposed having sex on their second evening together. Ever the gentleman, though, he added that he would be willing to wait until the third time, if she chose so.
Chris's OkCupid okay profile takes his obsession with immediate sex a step further, saying that women should message him if they're willing to get to the bedroom as quickly as right after the first date, given that the same profile also demands that women meet him in person as soon as two days after the first online contact, Chris has effectively shortened his expectations from three official dates to three days since the initial hello. Needless to say, this aggressive stance on immediate sex has not gotten him anywhere. Given how Chris is apt to take something that doesn't work and simply do it harder, it was only a matter of time until Chris started to demand absolutely no dates at all. In Jackie emails 22, Chris mentions how he realized he is not mentally ready for the relationship and says that he needs more socialization practice in real life for starters. However, even though he explicitly states that he doesn't want a relationship with Jackie, he still tells her that he wants to keep casual sex open as an option. Nobiophobia is a word Chris created that he describes as his general fear of girls being paired up. While normal people would suggest that this is a form of social anxiety, or that Chris is just love shy, Chris of course felt the need to coin his own term of it. Chris's nobiophobia manifested itself during the first months of his love quest, and it came to be because the girls he asked would often turn him down on the grounds that they already had a boyfriend, due to the infinitely high boyfriend factor. This eventually led to Chris's obsession with finding a boyfriend-free girl. In a moment of typical egotism, Chris decided his envy and resentment of men with girlfriends was a legitimate phobia, and so formed the word noviophobia. By using the Spanish word novio, meaning boyfriend, and the English term phobia, derived from the Greek word phobos, meaning fear, Chris uses this word often and simply assumes others will understand what it is without any explanation. Noviophobia as a name has several problems. First and foremost, Chris uses it to describe a jealous feeling towards men in relationships, something which is no way resembles a phobia, which is an irrational fear or a hatred. It also simply refers to boyfriends in abstraction, which isn't an accurate summation of Chris's issues with women who are in relationships. Finally, the word itself is a linguistic abomination. The prefixes for phobia should be ancient Greek in origin unless the word does not exist in Greek and cannot be Hellenicized, in which case an irregular word is formed using a Latin or an English prefix but still not a Spanish one. A more accurate term of Chris's illegitimate phobia would be herastophobia, as herastis is an ancient Greek word for a male, dominant lover, although as addressed as he possesses no actual phobia at all. The word has been alternative spelt as noyophobia, as it appears in Christian's letter to Nintendo Power about how Sprung has helped this condition. Chris later explained that this was an accidental misspelling. And that was the end of the video. I'm sorry it took so long. I was just really busy with uni and other stuff. I hope that you all enjoyed it and hopefully this video is up by the 24th of December. And with that said, goodbye.